All right. Uh, hi, Zach, Alexander. I'm excited to be interviewing you today. We're going to be talking about childhood sexual abuse and healthy masculine and feminine energy and healthy sexuality, maybe too. So, uh, go ahead. No, no. I mean, obviously, it's great to be a part of here. Uh, great to have this conversation. Um, I think more so than anything else, we're just talking about healing in general right and how embodying the masculine and feminine uh is important in our lives um and also how how much we don't talk about childhood sexual trauma and how that impacts our lives how that impacts our sexual lives how that impacts really all aspects of our being and just kind of drawing awareness to that i obviously you know i recognize your channel as one that promotes a, a, sec a healthy relationship with sexuality and sometimes child sexual trauma can be, can really inhibit that from coming about. And I'm someone with personal experience in my own life uh, with that as well. You know, I really want to commend you for talking about childhood sexual abuse because I think for men it's even harder to talk about it. But I also know from talking to women and talking to my clients, like my married clients, you know, my escort clients, um, if they say their wife never liked sex with them, I always suspect some kind of childhood sexual abuse, whether it was physical or just emotional and mental, saying that you shouldn't like your body and sex is bad. So there's a whole range of it, really, I think. It's, it's all abusive, but your mm -hmm. physical abuse is even more traumatizing, right? Because I mean, imagine you would feel betrayed and um, unsafe and angry and all these feelings. So can you explain maybe what a child would feel and how a child would deal with these feelings or these experiences. Yeah, sure. So um, a lot of ways in terms of child sexual trauma, we, we kind of, we can go uh, different ways, but we can, we can either go the way of assuming that sex is bad, right? That our sexuality is bad or that our only worth or value is derived from our sexuality, right? So a woman who goes through child sexual abuse at a young age can then be promiscuous from a very young age because they're taught that uh, their only value or worth is derived from being sexualized, right? Um, for men, and especially for me or whatever, that process was very emasculated, right? And so you have to build, like you, sometimes you can almost come into these notions of hyper-masculinity or toxic masculinity to kind of hide from the fact that you went through this act when you were at, at a young age that was very embarrassing. Um, and, and obviously there's a physiological effect of child sexual abuse that just creates shame within the physical body, right? Like I actually believe that shame is, is a physiological um, feeling. So uh, child sexual trauma has a number of different consequences that will carry on throughout the person's life into adulthood if it's not addressed. Um, and yeah, it's, it's something I think it's, we're now estimating that one in five children will be sexually abused, right? So think of the impact of that and think it, cause it goes beyond just even your, your relationship with sexuality. It goes, it goes into your relationship to be able to have healthy boundaries with people, to be able to trust others, right? Uh, to be able to form like intimate connections with friends. Uh, your self-worth, your value. So it really just has this reverberating impact on all areas of your life. Okay, so I have so many questions for you. I want to start though with, uh, go, go back to the child. So the child, like um, sometimes people repress these memories so they don't even know they were sexually abused. So I'm curious, what could help someone realize if they were sexually abused, maybe because they've blocked it out. But if they do remember also, like, what is it like for a child? Like, uh, do you have to dissociate? Because I remember even, um, like, seeing my brother get hit by my dad, I would dissociate from the pain of seeing it. Like, I would repress my feelings. I would dissociate. Uh, I would get mad at my dad. Uh, so I'm thinking for uh, there would be feelings like that. Like, how would a child deal with it? then how does it impact you and then how do you heal like um let's start with the child part how, and from yeah. you don't have to even share about yourself just even what you know from other people well i mean so yeah in terms of so i am a a holistic life coach with a trauma-informed approach right so um a lot of my clients that come into me do tend to have histories of child sexual abuse okay uh for me personally the, the thing that i 
that I will talk about is that it was incestuous, okay? And so for that, so I'm so, I'm so sorry, one second, I just need to close the door in my, uh, okay. my So I apologize about that, but so for me, mine was actually within the family. And so actually we're, all, we're estimating that almost 50% of child sexual abuse occurs with a family member, right? So what you're basically giving that child is the notion that nothing is safe, right? So oftentimes, especially when it's of a nature where it's in the family, the child does have to completely disassociate and repress the memories out of survival. Mm -hmm. Now, over time into adulthood, when the person starts to feel safe, like they have a support network that's not judgmental, um, right? And they feel they, they have a partner that they feel safe sexually with, right? That's, they're not being judged. That's when the met repressed memories can actually come back. If we want to retrieve the repressed memories so that we can work to heal them and work through the abuse, there need, we need to cultivate safety for the person, right? A lot of child sexual abuse is actually repressed. Uh, because it, the child does not know how to process that memory or what it means. So they have to dissociate as a means of just purely survival. Yeah, you know, I've thought a lot of times about whether I was sexually abused because some people would consider me a little bit on the promiscuous side. Mm -hmm. or, um, but I'm not sure. I mean, I don't have any memories of it and I don't, uh, I don't know, like, how would I know, for example, if my sexuality is healthy or not? I do know that when I was married for 25 years, I didn't cheat on my husband. I don't hook up, but I still, there's still a part of me, uh, could be how, what I was taught that thinks that my value to men is mostly sexual. And I don't know why I think that. So that's, I think for me, it has to do with, um, that my feelings weren't maybe fully acknowledged and that I didn't have the experience of men in my life caring how I felt. So I just kind of thought my feelings were part of weakness. So men like my intelligence and my nicety and my sexuality, but I don't know if I was sexually abused. How would I know? Um, you would feel you know, that's a really difficult question and, 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 and there's a lot of different dimensions to that. I mean, obviously the memories are going to be held in the body more so than anything else. Okay. So we're looking for certain triggers, right? Uh, you know, if you start to avoid sex or, 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 you know, if an image of an authority figure brings out, brings out like really like shameful feelings sexually in the body, we may be having memories of, of child sexual abuse. There's so many different layers in terms of being able to recall or understand whether we've been sexually abused or not, but the memories are going to be held in the body. So they will present themselves as body memories first. Like you'll feel it, you may be shaking, you'll feel the trauma in your body. It's not going to necessarily be visual. Okay, like there might be some kind of like, um, if I'm sexual with someone, there might be some kind of fear or repulsion or wanting yes. to pull away. Yes. And I think with hypersexualization, it could be women that always just want to have sex all the time. They don't know how to engage on an emotional level. Yes. So um, let's see. Now, here's the thing. I also, um, I love that you coach people on trauma because see, I don't do trauma coaching. So yeah. it would be like good for me to send people to you. But I like to help people more that like their sexual hangups or women not wanting to have sex with their husbands, let's say, is to, has to do with their upbringing, their programming, like their religious programming. Mm -hmm. And so I have tried in the past to reach out to these women or to find these women and talk to them about why they don't like sex. But these women never want to talk to me. They want to talk to me about sex as much as I want to talk about gardening or rock climbing. Like, I really don't care. What's the big deal? So I'm wondering how you have managed to find these people and get them interested in healing because in healing that, they're going to heal their whole self, right? And they start to experience a lot more joy because this trauma is blocking the joy too. How do you get people who don't want to talk about and bring up all that pain to want to deal with it? 
Um, well, healing trauma is multifaceted. So you're even talking about how you, you, you were, you were very like hypersexual from a young age too. And that could be probably due to the fact that you said your emotions and feelings were being invalidated, right? Maybe men were only acknowledging you, right? For being pretty or good looking, right? So those traumas, we, people, people are starting to recognize that their personalities tend to be nothing more than a lot of coping mechanisms or defense reactions to things that happened in childhood. So people are coming to me because they no longer want to be acting out these things, right? This goes way beyond just sexual trauma. I mean, this goes into areas of just shutting down intimately because when we're in a relationship, it goes way beyond sex. Sex is a sacred act, right? It really bonds two people together. But I have people who are afraid to just be vulnerable with their partner. And those are the things that I'm really looking at, right? And when, and when I'm talking about like child sexual abuse, I don't, I, you know, the sexual component of it is so small in terms of what I'm working to address. I'm working to address are people having difficulty setting boundaries, saying no to other people. And those boundaries could be physical, emotional, spiritual, right? Are you having difficulty speaking your truth or speaking up for yourself? Do you feel like a need to only meet other people's needs and you don't even know what you want yourself, right? Child sexual trauma goes so beyond just the act of sex. It, like I said, it integrates into all aspects of your life. And so people with this trauma, they come to me not just because they want a healthy sexual life, right? I mean, even for me, in my own life, I mean, this is something I still work through in my life. I mean, child sexual trauma still affects my sexual life and it's something that I'm actively healing too. What I work to heal is everything that composites it. Self-worth, the ability to say no to others, the ability to know yourself, to know what you want in life, right? What your purpose is, well, how you want to feel fulfilled. I mean, there's so many different facets to healing. And that's what I work to address with people. Okay, I love that. And then, um, like, what are some, uh, like, techniques that you use to help people with that? So... First off, if you've been through any type of sexual trauma, and so this isn't even child sexual trauma, right? This could be sexual assault in adult years, right? A lot of women have, have faced this, obviously. Most people had to leave their body, as we talked about, disassociate to be able to make it through that event. So I deal with, I, I, I see a lot of women who've been through sexual assault, right? Even in their adult years. And it's my responsibility to get them back in their bodies. So I take them through a lot of breathwork exercises. I get them to scan their bodies. I get them to notice where the tension is held in the body because the body is what stores the actual trauma. Then I take them through deep breathwork exercises, breathe in, put your awareness on that point in the body. And sometimes it's about allowing the body to shake trauma out or scream or yell. The body needs to complete the response to that sexual trauma, okay? Um, and so it's, and it's also just about getting people to feel what it's like to have your feet on the ground, feel what it's like to have your hands on your thighs, right? Just learning how to be present because if you've been through sexual trauma, it's very difficult for you to be present with your own body, right? You're constantly in your head. Mm, because the body wasn't a safe place to be. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of what you described from sexual trauma, though, I can relate to it. I really don't think I had sexual trauma. Uh, I'll just talk about myself for a sec. See, my yeah. parents were really against sexuality. My mother, my mother is a teacher of transcendental meditation, and she taught me to meditate when I was pretty young. And she said, when people are enlightened, they don't want sex. And my dad had a very unhealthy masculinity. He said that women were just good for release, like they are just ejaculation yeah. devices for men. I overheard him saying that to my mom when I was little and I was shocked. So I just think I, I had some negative, in my dad's Persian, he never wanted me to date. So I wasn't allowed to want sex and I wasn't allowed to date. So I was very curious about it and, and I decided, I guess I was maybe a, te a young teenager, I decided, I want to meditate and be a very spiritual person, but I also want to be a very physical person. I didn't want to reject my sexuality, but in order, and I was afraid I would um, be enlightened from my meditation before I could ever, ever have sex. I feel like I'm in a therapy session with you. <laughs> and, so, and so I'm like, 
I better start just finding the first guy who'll fuck me before it's too late and I'll never know what it's like. So I was 16 when I had my first sexual experience and then I had to sneak out because I wasn't allowed to date boys that even didn't want sex for me. I wasn't allowed to date them. And so I was just very curious. I think I was kind of rebelling a little bit. Um, but, but also when I was growing up, feelings were not welcome, especially among boys. Like I'm a lot older and I'm 58. So, um, the boys at that time were told they were sissies if they cried. And even like our parents were busy working and we didn't have all this knowledge about feelings and feelings weren't welcome. And I, I, I'm doing a lot of work on myself now to like opening my heart. Cause I realized I closed my heart down a lot. But sex to me always feels very safe because in our family, we were very affectionate. And mm -hmm. so I like touch a lot. That to me feels very calming and soothing. Like if a man, like with my clients, I love when they hold me tight and hug me and they're passionate mm -hmm. with me and look in my eyes. Like that's my love language. Yeah. But at the same time, I haven't done any dating and I'm realizing that, um, you know, my ex-husband was a lot like my parents in that it wasn't safe for me to feel things because feelings made him uncomfortable. I think I can relate to um, uh, not really feeling okay to express what I feel or knowing what I feel because I numbed a lot of it because feelings weren't welcome. And yeah. then sexuality was a maybe totally on par because I had to repress it you know mm. I think uh and as women too we feel often I think that we're not supposed to like sex or we're bad if we like it or even when I was married I thought if I let my husband know I like it he won't respect me because I was taught that yeah. men respect women who like sex or who've had sex so I, I'm still working through what I think is all my negative programming. And I can just think that for people who were physically abused, it would even be much worse. Because it's been a long journey for me to undo what I think is just the mental programming. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a, definitely a lot of subconscious programming, right? That your body's bad or that your value is only to be just like, it's just to be used yeah. during sex rather than figuring out what your needs are, what you like, what you want, right? This also comes from a lot of religious trauma is that, we, that we're told to suppress these desires rather than acknowledge them and embrace them and figure them out, right? So it makes a lot of sense. And like I said, you know, uh, con like we're talking, what we're talking about is intimacy and connection and sex is part of that and being vulnerable and feeling your feelings is part of that. And if that was negated growing up, we're going to be shut out. Right. And so people can even be having sex without even being tied into the emotional component of it too. And so then we're also missing another aspect of what this experience is supposed to be. So it, that's why when we're talking about healing trauma, it's not just healing the sexual trauma, it's healing the fact that like, were you shut down emotionally by a parent? Were you not allowed to express vulnerability? Right. And how does that impact all facets and areas of your life? You know, and I think that is trauma. Uh, even though I wasn't physically abused, I think I was spanked twice. I feel like um, uh, like this numbness I've had in my heart that I'm trying to unthaw. It is a mm -hmm. form of trauma, like because we're supposed to be love, and if I can't access it, and it was just innocent little things like uh, you know not liking something my parents said to me, and I'm like, ooh, this feels bad. I don't know how to deal with it. I guess I'm just gonna dissociate, or I'm just gonna push it down or numb it. I'm like, I got it. I, I remember just thinking, I'm just going to push this down and make it go away. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, uh, I have a little grandson who's two and my daughter um, is like so good, always attending to his feelings, attending to his feelings. But at the same time, it makes it hard for her to say no to him because then he cries and he's upset and she just wants to nurture his feelings all the time. So he's like this really self-expressed, beautiful boy. Um, and now that I'm older, I can look back and see how important it is to nurture a child's feelings. See, when I was a young mom, I was so stressed all the time. I couldn't always think about their feelings. And I didn't have the knowledge. So I tried a lot of things, but I wasn't as good as I am now. I think that parents, uh, I just wonder if there's a way to avoid ever hurting a child's feelings. 
even with my little grandson, you know, if I have to tell him no, or I have to give him a consequence, he doesn't like that. And he'll cry. And I think I hurt his feelings and he might look down and cry. And I know I hurt his feelings. It's almost, I think there's almost like, um, no matter how good the parents intentions are, the human experience is going to cause some pain that we have to heal as adults. I just don't even know how to have him around without ever hurting his feelings. You know, I'm cooking, I have to cook and he wants my attention. I'm like, I can't give you attention. He's hurt. And he gets so much attention. I'm just giving you examples. Like, I don't even know how we avoid uh, hurting uh, inadvertently our children. It's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, no matter what, we're going, we're going to hurt our children to some degree. Um, and, and all we can do, the best we can do is just allow our children to fully express their full range of emotions, to hold space for that, right? And to not suppress them and invalidate their feelings. Yeah, and that's what we do with him. Like when he starts to cry like that, you know, like, oh, I can see you're sad. I can see that you're frustrated. I know I really hurt your feelings. I really love you. You know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry. I have to get off in a few minutes. Is that okay? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so let's just finish up. And uh, I'd love for people to know how they can contact you and work with mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So my my practice is actually full at this point. Um, but you can look at me, you can find me through my Instagram at ZA Energetic, or you can find me on my YouTube channel, Zach Alexander. Uh, like I said, I'm mainly focused on spirituality and healing from trauma. Um, but yeah, this has been a terrific interview and, and thank you for having me on. Thank you. And I'm going to post the links in the description below so people can contact you. And All right. Thank great. Thank you so much. Hearing from, the, from a man, uh, a male coach. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. Okay. Thank you. Bye.